Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Joe Saramelli. I oversee Grand Rounds uh, for our department. So a couple of things I want to walk through just about the Grand Round series before I introduce today's presenter. Uh, number one, please write any comments or questions into the chat or the Q&A anytime during the presentation early on, halfway, whatever you prefer. I'll keep track of those and I can go through those at the end uh, with Dr. Russell. There's an expanding group of people uh, working on Grand Rounds each week, partly because starting in November, the first Friday of each month, we're going to uh, resume in-person and which will be a hybrid Grand Rounds presentations at Harborview Medical Center with the remainder of presentations remaining as webinars. And uh, Semhar uh, is continuing to work on coordination and communications, Mike on technology, and Charles on the local uh, coordination at Harborview for the hybrid events. Uh, there's several sources of funding for this year's series from the Ripley Fund, the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions, and the Treatment of Mood Disorders Fund. Uh, uh, we also record presentations and, and uh, put them on the, on the department website under the education section. And with that, I'll, I'll turn over to talking about today's uh, presenter. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Douglas Russell. Now, Dr. Russell is an assistant professor of psychiatry here in the University of Washington, uh, working at Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Russell directs the psychopharmacology program at Seattle Children's Pearl Clinic and has clinical and research interests in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, prevention and health promotion, integrated and collaborative care and complementary and integrative approaches to child and adolescent mental health. Uh, Dr. Russell is, is co-investigator actually on, on several ADHD clinical research studies through the Pearl Clinic, um, including one related to treating parents with ADHD and their children. Uh, I think you know, Dr. Russell also does, has, has a prominent educational role in numerous uh, courses and clinical settings. Uh, within child and adolescent psychiatry, and last year had received uh, the faculty teaching award in child and adolescent psychiatry. Notably, I, I think beyond uh, sort of clinical education, and uh, Dr. Russell helps to promote scholarship in child and adolescent psychiatry, partly through mentorship and supervision of fellows, but also teaching interesting courses such as an introduction to scholarly inquiry. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, Dr. Russell and I spoke several months ago to talk about a presentation on ADHD, given the, the more common clinical scenarios that many adult psychiatrists are encountering. And I think when we were talking about it, I had said, why not, you know, maybe just a, a, a summary on all the uh, current evidence that's come out in the last couple of years. And what I appreciated through that, that discussion is that ADHD is one of the, maybe the most researched disorder in child and adolescent psychiatry. And that would take a lot of presentations to cover even recent research. So We've asked Dr. Russell uh, to cover a lot today and very eager to, to hear his presentation. So I'll stop it. I'll stop at that and turn it over to Dr. Russell. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, really pleased uh, to be here speaking to a hometown crowd. Um, hopefully I'll get that home field advantage in the uh, 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 in the in the feedback forms, but we'll see. We'll wait till questions. Um, so um, I'm excited to talk to you about ADHD across the lifespan. You know, I think it, we've traditionally the, the the field has thought of ADHD as a childhood disorder, but I think increasingly, especially over the last uh, ten and tw or twenty years, we're recognizing the functional impairments associated with uh, adult ADHD. Um, so. I'm gonna hopefully um, uh, paint a picture of, of ADHD across the lifespan for you and also arm you with some, some clinical tools uh, to treat ADHD in your patients. Here, let me um, start sharing here. I also understand that this is gonna go up on, on YouTube eventually. I'm really excited about that. It's my first YouTube video. So those of you joining on, on, on YouTube in the future, don't forget to hit the like button down below and subscribe to my Patreon page or the UW's Patreon page. I don't know if actually UW has a Patreon page, 
Um, somebody's got to fill out a outside work form for that. All right, well, here's um, uh, my disclosures. Um, so Joe mentioned that I'm involved in some uh, clinical research. I'm also a consultant for the Washington chapter of the American Academy of, of Pediatrics. I sit on the board uh, of the American Professional Society of, uh, for ADHD and Related Disorders. Um, I'm supposed to also, of course, mention if I'm going to be talking about off-label uses of medications. Of course, we do that a lot in child and adolescent psychiatry. I don't actually know if I'm going to be talking about any of those things, but I put it up there just in case. And I also have a not-so-hidden agenda here. I want to help my colleagues in adult psychiatry feel more comfortable treating ADHD. It's really fun and actually really rewarding to treat ADHD across the lifespan. And I'm hoping after today, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable doing that. So I'm gonna provide some background about the disorder um, and uh, focus on associated functional impairments, uh, which is where I think the, the conversation really should go around this disorder. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the perspective of ADHD as a lifespan condition as opposed to a childhood disorder. And I'm gonna prepare you guys to assess and treat ADHD across the lifespan, at least start, start that conversation. As Joe mentioned, it's a lot to, to, to cover in, in one hour. So I'm gonna be doing sort of a crash course and I've tried to tailor it to, to make it useful uh, for my uh, colleagues in adult psychiatry. All right, so why are we talking about this now? Um, well, partly uh, it's because we have a nationwide psychostimulant shortage. I'm sure you guys have all encountered this clinically probably. It's really hard to get treat our first line treatments for ADHD right now. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, the ADHD is also, um, you know, changed in the public mind a lot since the pandemic, especially. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a second, but, you know, if you go on social media I don't usually encourage people I'm, I'm, I'm giving a lecture to to take out their phones, but if you have it handy, just go to Instagram or TikTok or whatever, type in hashtag ADHD and see what you get. Um, you're gonna get a lot. Um, the, what, the, the stigma around ADHD um, is, is dissipating in a big way um, in our culture. Um, it's also a very relatable disorder. Right, and I think um, um, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about how that's um, uh, how the COVID pandemic and that have have sort of come together to contribute to the shortage. Uh, what I wanted to present here um, is a couple of graphs uh, around uh, stimulant prescribing in the U.S. starting um, in 2016 to 2021. This is the CDC's report on stimulant prescriptions of commercially insured. Uh, child and adults um, from 2016 to 2022 is published in, in March of this year. And I know there, are, hopefully you can see the, the, the difference between the lines here. The solid lines are five to 14 year olds, the traditional wheelhouse for ADHD, right? Middle childhood, uh, where it's diagnosed um, uh, primarily, um, and where the bulk of, of treatment in adolescent, child and adolescent uh, psychiatry um, uh, falls. That's the solid lines, right? You got females on the left, males on the right. The dashed lines are uh, older adolescents, uh, 15 to 24. All right, the dotted lines, uh, 25 to 49 adults. And then the dash, the, the dash dot, that's hard to say, dash dot uh, line, that's 50 to 64 year olds. I really want you to just take a peek at 2020 to 2021 um, in the dashed and dotted lines. So that's basically older adolescents and adults. See how that on the left, especially uh, in females, see that spike? That's about a 10% increase in one year in the United States for stimulant prescriptions. That's a lot. Take a look at um, the solid line. Prescriptions haven't changed much in middle childhood actually. Uh, and they've gone down a little bit actually in males in this same time period. The bulk of new prescriptions for uh, people with ADHD um, is, is in, it's in part being driven by uh, adult prescriptions. So recognition 
of impairment in adults, more diagnosis and more treatment, particularly adult females. Um, so you may have heard in the popular press about the perfect storm, right? That's that's contributing to the, the, the nationwide stimulant shortage. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. I think one is we've already mentioned, right? The increased recognition of functional impairment in adulthood, right? This is something that we, we have now some data, longitudinal data backing this stuff up. Um, there are a, a few sort of soldiers in the ADHD research field that are really interested in functional impairment, functional impairment in adults that have really um, uh, illuminated some of this for us. Um, decreased stigma and increased visibility. Um, you can all put down your phones now, by the way. Um, and then there's the COVID pandemic. Now let's focus on on COVID for a second. So this was a huge moment in our for our species, um, and certainly for uh, uh, our our culture, um, human culture, um, where suddenly it wasn't just you know single parents uh, of low socioeconomic status that were trying to juggle. Um, you know, their their work and their child care. Suddenly it was everybody. Everybody was at home multitasking, right? And I think as a result of that, people very quickly ran up against normal um, uh, limitations for attention, right? That we all have, especially when we're under stress as we all were, right? ADHD is a very relatable diagnosis. You know, it's not one where you can get an EEG or get an MRI or get a blood draw and, 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 um, uh, uh, and, and get a diagnosis, although there's interesting work around EEGs and, and ADHD as a biological marker. Um, you know, it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis. And, um, you know, if, if you're searching for it, you can sometimes find it, especially under periods of duress like the COVID pandemic. And then the second bullet point there is, I think, a systems issue that's really important to re recognize. That during the public health emergency, there was a relaxation of telemed uh, uh, prescription rules around uh, controlled substances, and of course, psychostimulants are controlled substances. Um, that, um, uh, it, it was incredible, actually, how quickly the market recognized this and responded to it. And suddenly you have a lot of um, uh, for-profit um, uh, uh, companies that are advertising uh, assessment and treatment of ADHD, right? Um, and you've probably heard anecdotal reports of, you know, huge caseloads and really reduced time um, uh, and some some questionable diagnostic practices. I'm not part of these companies. I've never gone through, you know, uh, I've never seen how they work. I don't know, right? I do know that one of them was investigated by the US Attorney's Office and no longer prescribes controlled substances. That was kind of a famous thing last year. Um, 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 but um, suffice it to say, there's a lot more that, that access to psychostimulants, especially for adults has really shot up during, especially during that year. Be interesting to see when that window closes um, next month, what happens. All right, um, so let's take a step back now. And I'll, I'll, this is a timeline of sort of ADHD history, uh, at least in the Western world, uh, starting in the 18th century. And it really was the, the end of the 18th century where ADHD was described in the scientific literature um, in, in Scotland and Germany in particular. Um, it entered the public mindset though, really in the 19th century. And a lot of that had to do with uh, a guy called uh, uh, Henrik Hoffman. He was a, a physician and the founder of the first mental hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. He was also a cartoonist um, and he has series of really um, popular uh, cartoons um, uh, called Fidgeting Philip, All right? Here's one of them. Um, and I, mean, I love this, I mean, look at this kid. Um, I feel like I just saw this kid in, 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 in clinic last week. Um, you know, it it was funny, and it's thought that also fidgeting Philip actually may have represented uh, doctor, one of Dr. Hoffman's own offspring. Uh, but it, it really wasn't until the latter half of the 20th century that, you know, knowledge about ADHD and ADHD as we know it was codified. Um, so it was really um, the it was the 19 the notable thing about the 1960s is that methylphenidate got FDA approval for uh, behavioral disorders in children. Um, 
you know, but it, it was still around the 1950s and 1960s that ADHD like symptoms were referred to as minimal brain damage. Right. It wasn't until the 80s with DSM three that ADHD, as we know it today, was was codified. Um, you know, it was the decade of the brain, the 1990s, where science around ADHD uh, really exploded. Um, and uh, people started to recognize ADHD as a uh, as a public health uh, issue. A um, lot of animal research, a lot of neuroimaging research, although, of course, we consider structural imaging to be rather crude, you know, uh, uh, today. But there was some really important work done in the late 90s and aughts around ADHD that informed our one of the theories about ADHD being a, um, a delay in maturation, particularly the, of the uh, prefrontal cortex. Um, and, um, you know, as we've moved into the, you know, the 2000s and the 2010s, science around ADHD has really, really exploded, uh, specific, uh, especially around um, uh, genetics of ADHD, um, around um, uh, some of the uh, functional neuroimaging and circuits that are involved um, in ADHD. I think this next decade, this or maybe the decade we're in now, but uh, I think it's really going to be known as the the decade of ADHD in adults. Um, here's a cartoon of uh, some of the uh, networks that are uh, implicated uh, in ADHD. Of course, we have our attentional networks, executive functioning networks, uh, frontocerebellar reward, frontostriatal networks. They're all they're all involved here. Um, there are a lot of theories about ADHD and where it comes from. I don't think there's any one that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, an umbrella theory that's emerged as the number one. I think it's all of these. And it gives you a sense, we're gonna go through them so you understand it, but you know, it gives you a sense of, there's a lot of different ways to get at, uh, uh, get at what we, the clinical syndrome of ADHD. Um, so the first big theory was that there was an abnormality of, in dopamine and noradrenergic uh, symptoms. And this is sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of like the serotonin uh, um, um, theory of, of depression. A lot of that was driven by how effective psychostimulants were. So methylphenidate and amphetamines, they uh, release dopamine and norepinephrine rather potently um, in the prefrontal cortex and, and, um, and that affects um, uh, attention and focus. And um, so if, if, if that's what they're doing and it seems to work, that must be the reason, right? Um, you know, the other big one that came around is the one we already mentioned, the delayed cortical maturation. This, this uh, notion that um, ADHD compared to controls scanned across development, you see this two-year lag in, in uh, the physical development of the prefrontal cortex. Um, notably, you know, the, uh, by the, you reach mid-adolescence, those av on average, those brains actually look the same. Um, um, the third is cortical hy hypoarousal. Right, and that was driven by EEG research. So an increase in slow wave EEG activity, a decrease in tonic electrodermal activity, uh, and of course, response to stimulants, um, which are uh, uh, excitatory. Um, neuroinflammation is another uh, newer one that a lot of people are talking about. And that's really connected to what we see uh, prenatally and all the uh, risk factors that, that lead to ADHD or seem to be associated with ADHD, maternal infection, fever, Right, smoking, um, uh, uh, obesity, exposure to toxicants, um, uh, exposure to the quote unquote Western diet. Interesting research by Felice Jacka there. Um, and um, and, um, uh, uh, and um, exposure to stress, um, especially in utero. Um, and then finally, there's, there's this new one that, newer one that's come out this last few years that a lot of people are talking about that I think is really interesting. It's disconnectivity syndrome. And this is related to um, uh, findings of the uh, around the default mode network, which is, of course, the uh, as many of you guys probably know in the audience. This is the, what your brain does when you're not engaged cognitively in a task, right? Um, that's the default mode network, and there's disrupted connectivity in ADHD between the default mode network and task positive uh, networks. It's like the default mode network is sort of busting through. <laughs> you know, when you're engaged in active tasks. I think that's pretty pretty interesting. Has implications also for some um, non-medication treatments, um, meditation in particular. All right, let's look at prevalence. Um, you'll see the prevalence in child and adolescence has gone up, right, in the last decade. 
Um, most modern, most estimates recently are around the nine to 10 um, percent range. Um, you know, for a long time, it was sort of in that five to six range. And by the way, that was consistent when they, we were looking at um, uh, international studies as well. Um, you know, um, when I was in training, I was taught, and I think this was true for a long time, that uh, black youth were under-recognized, right, in ADHD um, uh, clinical spaces, right? Black kids got ODD and juvenile justice, white kids got ADHD and psychostimulants, right? That phenomena. Um, but there's this meta-analysis that came out in 2021 um, that, you know, really kind of was, was eye-popping to me. Um, um, and um, it included about 19, uh, studies uh, with an N of about 150,000 black youth under 18. And it reported a prevalence of 14% in that population, which is uh, even higher than um, than white males, which uh, uh, previously held the held the top. Um, something I think we need to really uh, uh, grapple with as a field. Uh, boys are typically diagnosed in a two to one ratio to girls. Um, there's growing recognition that um, ADHD presents differently in boys in a lot of ways, um, particularly around um, hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. Um, and if you've got more hyperactive and impulsive symptoms, you're presenting yourself uh, uh, earlier usually because you become a problem in the classroom, right? Uh, whereas inattentive girls that are sort of quietly struggling in the back of the room don't necessarily get recognized till older. Um, or let's look on the adult side, right? You, you guys are probably all, already, oh gosh, it's talking about kids, forget it. You guys are already on the, on, on the right hand of the screen. I've got some other slides with this right left um, uh, thing for, for comparison, but you know, 2.5 up to 2.8 in 2017, I bet that number is gonna be much higher uh, with uh, recent estimates uh, if the stimulant, psychostimulant prescription rate is any indication. Um, you got to take those numbers. Those are conservative numbers, I would say. Um, the National Comorbidity Survey, for instance, in the U.S. in 2006 uh, cited an adult uh, prevalence of 4.4%. Um, what about the genetics of ADHD? Well, we know a lot more than we used to. Um, first of all, it's got it's really heritable. 74% um, uh, heritability index. I mean, that's approaching the heritability index for height. Right. Um, so it, it runs in families. Um, we had our, our, our first um, genome wide, large genome wide association study was published in 2019 that identified 12 independent loci that reached um, genome wide significance. Right. So we have a polygenic risk score for ADHD now, uh, which has already been associated not only with ADHD symptoms, but importantly with anxiety and depression. More on that soon. All right, so it's common, right? It's heritable, right? Common and heritable. We've been humans on this planet a long time. Why hasn't evolution snipped it out of the gene pool? Well, I think, um, you know, there's certainly conversations in the popular press about this as, you know, ADHD is not all bad. It's another way of being human, right? And there may actually, it may confer advantages in certain circumstances, right? Modern schooling with inflexible curricula uh, and overworked and under-resourced classrooms, you know, is not usually not one of those settings, right? But, you know, here are, are a few uh, or three really famous people that have ADHD. I think one looks a little bit more ADHD than the other, Steve Grohl on the right there from the Foo Fighters and, and Nirvana, of course. Um, and then we have a couple of Olympians here, um, uh, uh, and uh, Simone Biles and, and, um, and Michael Phelps, you know, greatest swimmer of all time. All three of them had ADHD as kids, pretty successful folks, right? Um, you know, I can't use these names anymore with the kids that I work with. <laughs> I'm too old, but you can still use them for your adults. So you can log these uh, pretty successful people, right? Um, all right, well, let's let's talk a little bit about the multiplex family, which is the other implication of something that's common and heritable, right? So you've got families where parents and kids probably both have it, right, in a, in a family, and in fact, um, there's about a 40% chance that if you've got a parent with ADHD that, you know, the, the, the child might have it, right? Good odds, right? Um, and um, here's a few more things that I think are important to recognize about the ADHD family. Um, one, 
ADHD in parents is associated with distress, uh, uh, increased distress in the first year postpartum, right? So it has implications for relational health, which as psychiatrists, we know, of course, impacts hugely social emotional development across the lifespan. Um, ADHD is associated with negative parenting styles as opposed to positive parenting styles um, uh, broadly. Um, and parent-child conflict, as we know, is also associated with externalizing symptoms. Um, treatment of parents with ADHD, we need more information about this, by the way, um, uh, but it seems as though the treatment of parents with ADHD improves adherence to behavioral parent training, which is our, one of our um, um, uh, psychosocial interventions for, for ADHD families. I also wanted to bring up here the similarity fit hypothesis, because you may encounter this in your work with, if, if you work with families where you, where you have um, um, ADHD is distributed within that system. The similarity fit hypothesis, the, the data is really kind of actually kind of mixed on it, but um, uh, the idea is that parents with ADHD are actually less distressed by um, uh, by ADHD symptoms in their offspring. Um, you know, again, like I said, the evidence seems to be mixed, but what we're, what, if you take the, you know, the, the, the literature that is, it does exist on this and you, and you look at it together, it appears that um, what matters is the severity. And where you have, if you have a, a parent with a, re, a, a, a lot of ADHD symptoms, actually they're more comfortable with their kid with ADHD symptoms. It's where you have uh, parents that have very mild symptomatology for ADHD where the conflict happens, right? So distribution within the system is, a ve is very, very important. And of course, when there's a big mismatch uh, with temperaments, with styles, um, that can create conflict. Um, you know, so, you know, when you're assessing your adults, think about their families. Think about how the family system is impacting the mental health of the person in your uh, in your office, right? Ask about this. You're certainly, I'm, I'm sure you guys are seeing um, uh, parents come in saying, hey, my kid got diagnosed with ADHD. I think I might have it also. I will, again, more to practical tools coming. But I wanna spend a little bit more time on, on, on background here before we jump into that. Um, negative functional outcomes associated with ADHD. Uh, you, there are a lot here and I've, I've broken it up um, by what we found in the child and adolescent research, uh, literature and then the adult literature. So in, in kids, decreased quality of life, social problems, academic problems, strained family relationships uh, uh, associated with substance use disorders in adolescents, associated with conduct problems and, and juvenile justice involvement, associated with higher rates of teen pregnancy and TBIs and other uh, accidental injuries. Moving over to adults, we know that adults with ADHD have a higher rate of motor vehicle accidents and other accidents lower educational attainment, lower household income, right? Relationship problems, substance use disorders, criminal behavior, premature death, and a higher rate of suicide. Um, you know, ADHD, recognizing it, treating it is important. All right, I don't know how many of you are in that, you know, uh, coming up against that 10 year maintenance of cert certification thing, but Eric Erickson's social emotional stages are on the left here. Uh, I really like, his framework. I still use it clinically. Um, and I put it up here um, to show as a sort of a proxy for uh, development, social emotional development across the lifespan. And I've distributed all those functional impacts um, from that previous slide. ADHD impacts the lifespan. Okay, it's important to recognize that. And the functional impairments associated with untreated or severe symptoms of ADHD, they're real. Um, all right. Diagnostic criteria, we will not go into this. I know you guys are familiar with ADHD um, uh, through your training, but six symptoms of, uh, of inattentiveness and or six plus symptoms of hyperactive impulsivity. It's gotta be in two settings, right? This is a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, it's not episodic. Um, uh, it's gotta be present for at least uh, six months and the, you have to see some onset of symptoms prior to age 12. And of course, like any disorder that we're, if you're going to call it a disorder and you're going to treat it, there has to be a impairment associated with those symptoms. All right, let's look at the adult side. DSM-5 made an important change. I think it was the right one um, because ADHD does seem to present a little bit differently in adults, but you only need five 
plus symptoms in each category or in either category or both categories uh, if you're combined presentation um, to qualify for the diagnosis. But it's still got to be in more than one setting, right? Um, and it's still got to be greater than six months, and you still got to have symptoms prior to age 12, right? If you're going to meet DSM-5 criteria, and of course, impairment needs to be present as well. Um, all right, so what is inattention in kids versus adults? Where well, the DSM criteria are, lifted, are, are, are listed on the left there, right? Doesn't listen to when, when spoken to directly, difficult sustaining attention, distractibility, avoidance of cognitive, cognitively difficult tasks. These are kids that lose things, they have poor organizational skills, they're, they're forgetful, right? Uh, on the adult side, um, that might manifest as someone who has extremely poor time management, difficulty initiating or completing or, or transitioning between tasks in their work. Um, you'll see a lot of procrastination and avoidance uh, in this group. And um, uh, 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 what about hyperactivity and impulsivity? Well, first of all, you should recognize that uh, hyperactivity and impulsivity do seem to wane in, uh, even in, uh, in folks that have combined presentation ADHD. They do seem to wane during early development. And, um, you know, kids that might have been climbing all, you know, all over the place when they were kids, you know, that sort of burns off through early development and into adolescence. And what you're left with is more of an inattentive picture often. Um, all right, so the hyperactive kid, right? The kid that can't stay seated, that ru runs and climbs excessively on the go, right? Talks excessively, difficulty waiting turn, interrupts, intrudes, et cetera. What does that look like in adults? Well, maybe it's a, an adult that's restless, right? Low frustration tolerance, employment instability, relationship instability, anger management, reckless driving, uh, makes hasty decisions, impulsive aggression, most, mostly verbal uh, with, with adult ADHD. Um, but... Um, you know, stuff that um, might even appear hypomanic, right? Um, differential comorbidity is huge in, in adult ADHD. We'll talk more about that soon. Um, here's the sort of the algorithm for assessing and treating ADHD in kids, right? You start with an interview. Uh, everything always starts with a really good history, symptoms, and you want to get psychosocial history. Then you, you're, you want to get collateral, right? Two plus settings. That's built in with kids especially kids in, in middle childhood, because you have school, right? You can you have a teacher that knows the kid, right? And you can give standardized symptom measures to the teacher and standardized symptom measures to the, the parent. And you've got, boom, you've got two settings. If that connect, if that corresponds to your clinical suspicion from your history, uh, well, then you can make the diagnosis and then you move on to a medical assessment. Right? You need a physical exam. Um, and crucially, you also want to get a personal history, medical history, and a family history of cardiac illness, right? Medical legally, that's the biggest thing for us treating ADHD. You cannot miss a lurking arrhythmia, right? The questions I ask are, you know, does, does the child have any uh, cardiac history, right? Has the child ever fainted from exercise in case there's something that, you know, never was worked up? Is there a family history of sudden cardiac death under age 35, right? You don't want to miss hokum, you know, the lurking in the gene pool or whatever. And then finally, you want to rule out learning disorders. Uh, up to 40% uh, of kids with ADHD also have specific learning disorders that are impacting their academic functioning, right? You don't want to miss that. You also don't want to medicate if that if that's what's actually happening. So you get cognitive and achievement testing, and you're able to do that usually for free through the public school system. Let's look at adults, right? It's, it's going to be different. It still starts with an excellent history. Right? You need to know the psychosocial circumstances. You need to know the symptoms. And crucially, you need to know the time course of those symptoms. Um, I elevate the medical assessment also. Because if you're thinking about ADHD, you're thinking about first-line treatments for ADHD, which are psychostimulants in adults, right? And these are uh, chronotropic, right? They increase heart rate a little bit. Uh, they increase blood pressure a little bit. You know, we're talking about a couple of points, uh, up to five points of blood pressure. Um, you, but you know, but you're also dealing with a population with heart disease. Right? You got to know that, um, and I think there's also medical mimics that you've got to rule out with, with uh, adults. So I elevate that a little bit. Um, getting collateral is much more difficult, though, right? In adults, uh, there are uh, adult uh, rating scales that you can use. The uh, AASRS is the Adult ADHD Self-Report Scale. That's non-proprietary. It's out there. Um, um, that's the one that we typically use 
There's a proprietary one in the Connors system. You probably heard about the Connors three. We use that a lot. Um, it's called the Connors Adult ADHD Rating Scale. Uh, that can be helpful. Um, cognitive testing, sometimes if it's reasonable. Um, you know, again, you won't, maybe there's a, a, a unrecognized learning disorder that might be impacting their functioning. Um, uh, but crucially with a lot of uh, adults with a lot of um, uh, more life history, you may wanna be uh, uh, looking for whether there's, uh, there's a, uh, something that's impacting them cognitively, right? Are there changes happening? Uh, and that's why they're coming to you now. Um, and you really got to get that cardiac history. I mean, that's that's probably the most important thing from the medical assessment point of view uh, for adults. All right, so it's difficult to get collateral, uh, but not impossible, right? If you've got a, a long-term partner, right, have them comment. Um, um, uh, you know, parents are usually uh, still in the picture, especially with, with adults that are uh, middle-aged or younger, right? Um, get permission to talk to them about it. You know, how, how else are you going to get a, a history of how they were in elementary school, right? Personal self-report of stuff like that um, is not great in adults. You want to be able to hang your hat on uh, on some longitudinal um, uh, uh, symptom present or presentation, right? Uh, you, you don't want this to be something that's, that's uh, uh, brand new, right? If it is, it's probably not ADHD. It's something else. You know, although, of course, there's still stigma out there, um, and sometimes patients will allow you to talk to their employer, right? That's another, uh, another setting uh, where you can get information. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's too disruptive to use um, a, um, uh, a standardized symptom measure, like the, the Connors one I mentioned, because it has, has a, a observer report uh, versions of it, um, you know, at least a phone call, right? You got to get that extra piece. Um, medical mimics are really important, uh, uh, extra important, I think, in adults as they collect medical problems over time. Got to think about sleep problems, affects attention, nutritional issues, uh, food insecurity, um, medications, right? Is this a, a patient that's taking corticosteroids, right? Is this a patient who's activated from antidepressants? Um, hypothyroidism, is that why they're inattentive, right? Are they, do they have seizures that are under controlled? Um, is there a genetic syndrome that hasn't been identified? You know, is there lead exposure? Uh, is this a, 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 an individual with fetal alcohol exposure? Uh, traumatic encephalopathy, of course, uh, important in adults. Uh, but other, uh, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's sim as simple as constipation, too. Um, and also, of course, especially as you get with older adults, you got to think about neurodegenerative disease uh, driving um, uh, some of that. Let's look at comorbidities in adults. All right, here's a chart. Um, comorbidity is the rule, right? Not the exception. Look at these numbers. Um, so 47% um, uh, in the national comorbidity study uh, from 2006, where these numbers come from, 47% uh, had a coexisting anxiety disorder uh, versus 19.5% in the non-ADHD non group. 38% mood disorder versus 11%. 15% substance use. Uh, versus 5.6 percent. Um, you know, for those that are more color oriented, I've color coded them for you here. Mo uh, affective disorders in in orange, anxiety in yellow, and and substance use disorders in pink. There. Um, so you know, during your assessment, you need to ask about these other things. You need to do a good psychiatric review of systems. You know, is this adult in front of you um, not concentrating because they have a neurovegetative depression? Right, that's a criteria, right? Can't concentrate well, right? Changes in concentration. Um, again, time course is so important. All right, so assessing ADHD in adults, I get it. It's not easy. Uh, oh, uh oh, I can't see you guys right now, but I think I'm starting. You guys are starting to look a little discouraged to me. I just get that sense. You know, I think we need a visit from from Jessica. I think you need to to engage in some some self-affirmation here before we, we get going. Let's hear from Jessica. Look, I can be a shark. Now my whole house is great. 
I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my hair. I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my whole house. My whole house is great. I can do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Jessica. You too can treat ADHD in your adults. You too can make that diagnosis and treat it when it's appropriate. All right. So let's look at treatment now. Treatment is actually often the easy thing. It's the assessment that takes uh, uh, it takes some expertise, I think, uh, and some practice. Um, children and adolescents, first line treatment, psychostimulants, right? The MTA um, uh, established psychostimulants as first line. Uh, and that's unlike other disorders, psychiatric disorders that we treat in kids, right? Where we reach for um, uh, psychotherapy first, like in depression or anxiety disorders. But in ADHD, not so. We 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 reach for uh, medications first. A, a word on that, uh, why in just a second. Behavioral parent training is often also considered um, uh, important in the treatment of children and adolescents. That's particularly true when there's externalizing symptoms uh, present in the home. And then academic supports, right? You want to hit all of the settings where you see the, the child, right? You want to help them in school. You want to help them in their relationships at home, help with relational health, right? Family system work, right? Um, and, and then you want to treat the disorder itself. In adults, psychostimulants really are the, are, are the first line treatment. Um, second line treatments do exist though. CBT for ADHD uh, emerged with some evidence in the, uh, in, in the, in the aughts. Um, nice option. Um, you know, there's ADHD lifestyle coaches and stuff like that out there now. There's a whole industry um, uh, uh, to, to help people with executive functioning deficits and attentional deficits out there. And then we have lifestyle treatments too, right? Physical activity, um, uh, nutritional, um, uh, attention to nutri uh, nutrition, et cetera. Um, for those of you that, that don't have this handy, get it handy. This is the Cohen medication guide. It's available for free. You just have to click a box saying you're not going to sell it and you get a PDF of it. Um, so useful, updated regularly. Um, and you, it has photos of all the commercial, the uh, domestically available uh, um, uh, uh, treatment products out there, medications out there. Again, ADHD is very, runs in families, right? Sometimes your history is not that great. Sometimes these families are a little scattered. You know, and, and, and if they have trouble remembering what medication they tried, you know, when they were a kid or whatever, slap this on the table and say, what did it look like? Right? Amazing that we have this. The other thing that's really useful is that the vertical columns are, uh, are approximate relative, uh, 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 are co of comparative potency, right? So if you need to move between, um, uh, 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 between um, uh, 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 agents, you've got that option. There's amphetamines and methylphenidates there. All right, comparative efficacy, uh, child and adolescent um, uh, efficacy in the middle there and adults on the right. Pretty high effect sizes, right? Large effects uh, for these agents. You'll see on the methylphenidate side that the, the bolds are, I would say, the first line, what you should go with um, uh, uh, in adults and, and in children. You may wonder, oh, why aren't you going with amphetamines in kids? It's got a higher effect size overall. Um, Right. Well, well, there's also more side effects associated with amphetamines. And methylphenidates are better tolerated, particularly in prepubescent kids. But once you get into adolescence and adulthood, amphetamines edge out methylphenidates um, in terms of efficacy. So you usually want to go there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 large effect sizes, you know, blows antidepressants out of the water. Um, side effects are listed here. Um, decrease appetite, insomnia, headaches, emotional ability sometimes if you overshoot growth slowing for kids, um, increased heart rate I mentioned, and a very low rates of psychosis. You're dealing with dopamine, right? Here's what it looks like for, for adults. I really, again, you move that, that, that cardiac stuff to the top. Um, my, my risk benefit discussion with parents, with adults is much different than with kids who have very flexible cardiovascular systems. Um, all right, so 
how do I uh, how do I approach treatment? Where you want to do a multi dose titration, you can do that with stimulants because they're in and out of your system within a day. In the beginning, there was Ritalin, right? For decades, there was Ritalin, um, but it was only two to four hours per dose, so it had to be dosed, you know, multiple times a day, which was stigmatizing for the child who had to be pulled from class. Also, stimulants work best when they're ascending. Uh, in the blood, not not so great when they're they're coming out, and that up and down. Sometimes you can get some withdrawal irritability across the day. Some kids are susceptible to that. It wasn't great. Uh, the MTA study did a flexible dosing. It was a flexible dosing study. I think that's the real genius of that math, the methodology of that study, by the way, um, where they tried what would be a low dose for a kid, twenty five kilos and up, uh, what would be a medium dose, and what would be a high dose. We tried each for a few days to see what's the best fit, what the optimal fit for this this child ahead of you same you should do the same thing for adults but anyway this is this is what they used in the mta and then in 2000 concerta came along um concerta was the first long acting uh truly long acting once a day uh stimulant and it was modeled after uh ritalin three times a day this is a obviously an artist's rendition of the psychokinetic profile here um uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's still methylphenidate. It's just the technology, right? Immediate release Ritalin on the outside of this uh, torpedo looking thing, laser driven holes on either end, osmotic release, um, water comes in, pushes long acting drug uh, out as it goes through the digestive tract. Pretty amazing. But it was modeled after uh, Ritalin three times a day. And why do I think about it this way, right? Um, well, um, uh, first of all, I like to do a low, medium and high dose titration. Right, five days is sort of a sweet spot where you can you know, you eliminate you, you smooth out confounders, but you get a good sense of what the positives and negatives are, uh, and you make that flexible, right? In terms, if you're dealing with a, a child, you tell the parent, hey, you know, if you go to the next rung up and you have intolerable side effects, we'll stop it or go back down. You have that flexibility, you have that power. Um, I, I I encourage you to do the same thing with with your adult patients. Uh, but do a multi-dose titration. I think that's the biggest um, mistake I see among pediatricians that aren't well-trained with, with working with stimulants is they're like, oh, take the low dose. We'll start at 18. Oh, come and see me in a month, right? And then you're like, well, I don't know if it worked. Maybe it did. There was that night that where you couldn't sleep. And then I don't know. Well, then try the next dose. Come and see me in, in, in two months, right? You don't need to do that with psychostimulants. You can get to a maintenance dose quick, right? It's fun working with these agents. Um, anyway, so that's the multi-dose titration that I do for a kid 25 kilos and up, um, uh, 18 for five days, 36 for five days, 54 for five days. And I again, I think about it as three Ritalins in case I need to extend duration, right? I'm gonna add a, an immediate release Ritalin, a fourth bump, and that's gonna determine the strength of the, uh, of, of the booster. If I'm on 36 of Concerta, I'm gonna give a booster of 10 of Ritalin because that'll be the smoothest. Anyway, here's the three dose titrations of the most commonly prescribed stimulants. And you know, uh, for instance, in the TPAC study, we start at Adderall XR20, but I think in clinical practice, uh, just general practice, I recommend actually following these doses, even though they're the same for, for kids and adol uh, adolescents and you're dealing with adults, right? Uh, I, I suggest you start low, right? Because I've seen enough adults that have sensitivity to the 10 milligram, for instance, of Adderall XR, uh, and you can still go so quick with these agents right? Um, uh, I recommend just starting low, particularly also around the cardiac issues associated with psychostimulants. Anyway, I would just memorize this three-dose titration uh, for these four. Some of the newer agents that have come out, like Jorne or Adzentius or whatever, um, you know, don't as easily adhere to um, this, these, this titration uh, schedule, um, but these are the ones that you're most likely to prescribe anyway, particularly the ones on the right, Adderall and Vyvanse. Cool thing about Adderall XR, by the way, um, you can just prescribe a bottle 30 of 10s and say, take one for five days, take two for five days, take three for five days, come and see me in three weeks and we'll see where you're at. Nice. Um, a little word about, um, oh, I realize we're, I'm gonna have to bust through this, but I know you want to, you want to hear about uh, psychostimulants and substance abuse. So we'll go through this quick. Um, so common questions. Does stimulant treatment increase the risk for stimulant abuse later in life? Is it a gateway drug? We know the answer is no, we've investigated this. Um, does ADHD increase the risk of substance use disorders on, on their own? Yes, that's a well-known association, right? Makes sense if, when you think about it, particularly transitioning to adolescence. I don't like school, school doesn't like me, I'm gonna hang out with those kids. Plus there's an element of self-medication involved. 
The stimulant treatment reduce the risk of substance use disorders? That's the big question, right? It's one we couldn't answer, at least through the, through the science for a long time. But longitudinal research uh, over the last decade, especially last few years, um, uh, it, it appears that the answer is yes. And we've, all, we've hoped for that clinically and, and, and seen it, but it's nice to have it codified in the, uh, uh, in, in the data as well. Non-medical use, right? Um, uh, an important consideration. Diversion happens, but look at that range, right? That's, that range is so wide to be not useful. Uh, the other, only takeaway there really is that it's happening, right? And you got to pay attention to it. I like stuff like this 2020 online survey, 18 to 30 year olds, about a thousand of them, uh, where they asked about lifetime intranasal use of uh, uh, stimulants, 32%, mostly, you know, it was mostly college age uh, by far, but um, Adderall, immediate release Adderall is the biggest offender there. Um, so we have a shortage of psychostimulants. So I thought I'd at least put on my complementary and integrated medicine hat and talk briefly about physical activity. We're going to burn through it. Um, I always are looking for prevention stuff. Um, uh, physical activity in adolescence is associated with reduced symptoms in adulthood. That's awesome. Um, what do we know about dose and duration? Well, the CIFR um, uh, meta-analysis that said that physical activity reduces core symptoms by an effect size of about 0.3 um, identified these things. 20 to 30 minutes uh, per occasion, two to three times a week, moderate to vigorous intensity is the stuff that makes a difference with attention. Other uh, uh, literature has pointed to team sports as being particularly effective and green space uh, reduces uh, aggression in youth. So I always encourage team sports outside if, if a kid can tolerate it. Adults, mm, sorry guys, we got to work a little harder, 45 minutes per occasion and three to five times per week. Now I put this in parentheses because we don't have data for ADHD, not a lot of it um, uh, to guide us, but we do have data looking at um, uh, effects on uh, mental health generally and depressive symptoms. Um, and um, uh, this article in Lancet from 2018, which looked at um, 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 uh, uh, um uh, close to um, 1.2 uh, million uh, uh, folks in the United States looking at habits, uh, including exercise habits, and uh, had them pick non or bad mental health days or whatever as a measure um, of effectiveness. And popular sports, cycling, and gym exercise was the biggest. Here are some other complementary integrative treatments that are important. Come see me after if we want to. If you want to just discuss that a little bit further, always happy to do so. All right, so back to negative functional uh, outcomes here. Um, does treatment help? I'm going to highlight all this stuff where we have data, hard data to suggest that it does help. Okay. That's a lot. This is a big deal to find ADHD and treat it. And I hope, you know, when you look at this page with children and adolescents on the left, adults on the right, I hope you're also seeing families, right? Um, you can really help families if you recognize uh, and treat. So ADHD is a lifespan condition. Pay attention to the distribution of symptoms within a family, please. Um, uh, existing treatments do work really well and providing care to ADHD families is fun and rewarding. Um, big ups to um, the Pearl um, uh, team and, uh, and research uh, team, especially Mark Stein, my mentor in all things ADHD and the, um, uh, the mentor that got me into uh, clinical research for the first time. So thanks, Mark. All right, happy to answer questions. I know we're, we've only got a few minutes left here. We've got um, we, certainly a lot to cover. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Russell. A lot of information and questions, yeah. probably as you'd imagine related to treatments. And I wonder if you'd yeah. comment on a question that came up. I mean, I think you had made a comment about ADHD when assessing an adulthood not being an episodic condition certainly looking for the longitudinal course, how might one approach episodic treatment, either a day within a week to not take a stimulant, longer durations of, of stopping stimulants? Yeah, could you comment on that? Yeah, um, that's another thing that's kind of fun about treating ADHD is our, our first line treatments are extremely flexible, right? They work for a few hours, then you're out of your system. They're gonna work the same on Mondays they did on Friday. Right, you can hold it over weekends. 
You don't need to taper on, you don't need to taper off, right? That makes them very, very useful. Um, and you, when you have adults, right, that have complex schedules, especially these days where they're shifting, they may have a, a week where they're not doing any um, uh, uh, demanding tasks and then two weeks where, they're, where they are, right? You can be flexible with psychostimulants. Can't be so flexible with non-stimulants. Um, uh, but um, yeah, you, you can absolutely, ab absolutely do that. Again, uh, with, AD, with ADHD in adults, you work with those adults, right? In partnership figure out when they need that treatment, what it, in what way is it helpful and when when do we when do we want to prioritize it? There was an assessment related question. I, th I think in uh, way, uh, how much might one weigh symptoms or impairments in one domain versus another, the workplace or school compared to at home or socially? Uh, is this more common in adulthood to see a greater disturbance in one place versus another? And how, yeah, how might one sort through that? Well, with especially with severe symptoms in ADHD in adulthood, you see it in, in multiple settings, right? You see it in their relationships, instability, relationship instability, you see it at home with emotion regulation issues, anger management issues, right? You also see it in work, right? Where they can't sustain employment maybe com uh, compared to their non-ADHD peers, um, uh, have more conflict uh, uh, at work. Um, you know, I think it's about severity, right? Or like, when do you choose to treat? Well, what's the degree of impairment, right? If you have, you have somebody who's, who's getting into motor, motor vehicle accidents multiple times a year, that's not just related to alcohol or whatever, right? You may prioritize treatment for that individual, right? Just in terms of safety. Right. If you've got somebody who's at risk of housing uh, insecurity as a result of uh, not being able to maintain employment. Right. You're what you want to prioritize that. On the other hand, if you have a really high functioning adult. Right. Who who has problems in some settings, but not not in others. And they're they're you know, functioning well and they have, you know, their their family relationships are not impacted. Well, maybe they don't meet criteria. Right. Or maybe you can prioritize non medication options for that individual options that have much lower effect sizes, but may be appropriate for mild symptoms. It's an interesting uh, comment at the end of that response. It gets to another question. It's a, it's a longer question, but it's it comes back to the, the, the beginnings of your presentation with many adults uh, running up to the limits of attention when demands were higher, stresses were higher. And the, the question relates to uh, is that maybe trying to quantify it or maybe qualitatively how much or how, to what extent is that contributing to this uh, diagnosis of ADHD in adults, stimulant prescription and so on, uh, the interrelatedness of the limits of attention, stimulant uh, di ADHD diagnosis, stimulant prescription, uh, yeah. might, might this taper off what, what, and so on? Yeah, well, I think we need to be good stewards of this diagnosis and the limited resources that we have Right, it's clear that those resources are limited. The psychostimulant shortage has been really horrible for uh, kids that have ADHD that really need it, uh, uh, you know, to to help with their academic and social functioning. Right, it's been really, really bad. I think we need to bear that in mind and make sure we're doing a thoughtful assessment, making sure this is not circumstance. Right, this is not environmental that's causing this, but this is a neurodevelopmental condition where you have evidence over time. Um, I, I do want to speak to one, I'm just glancing over here at the q and I do mm -hmm. want to speak to the lack of guidelines about ADHD treatment in adults. That was something the FDA and, and the DEA recently on August 1st released a letter about the stimulant shortage, and they called for that. We need guidelines, right? Those guidelines are forthcoming. In fact, they'll, you'll, uh, there'll be a draft of those um, uh, released soon. The uh, 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 American Professional Society of ADHD, ADHD and Related Disorders has a task force that's been working on this for the past two years. And those guidelines are ready, uh, almost ready for publication. So you will have guidelines very soon that are consensus driven by experts, um, international experts too. Hmm. Um, so stay tuned for that. I think that's gonna be, that's sorely needed uh, in this field. And I think we'll address a lot of the fidelity issues that we might be experiencing in terms of diagnosis and treatment in the adult space. Well, look, here, here we are just, just after one o'clock. I recognize there are many more questions than we had time to get to. It's clearly an, an area 
that many of us see clinically and have uh, uncertainties about. And I, I, I appreciate your, your time today, Dr. Russell, walking us through this guidance, talking about these guidelines that are coming out, what a useful point uh, at the end to look for. And, and thank you for your time today and going through quite a bit about ADHD as we all sort of move through this uh, in our clinical practices. So we- Yeah, we and happy to, to talk with anybody offline that's interested. Um, um, and any partners out there, potential partners out there who want to um, uh, work on on um, uh, treating adults in the UW system. Let's get together. Right. Very, very Thanks, good. Joe. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll end grand rounds there for today. Take care.